triangle. One hundred eighty degrees. you were having trouble locating a snowmobile to come and get me? Well, of course I'm in the White Mountains, but it's summertime. There's no snow. <laughs> what do you mean, oops? L listen, Phil, I gotta go. I've got a great interview lined up, okay? Yeah, bye. I'm Sybil Sawyer, here with forestry technician Doreen Urquhart. Doreen, we found out yesterday that some of these pine trees are going to be cut down. Now, are you responsible for the actual cutting? No, I come in here long before the lumberjacks do any cutting. My job is to count and mark the trees with this paint gun, the ones that should be cut. Can you step back, please? 
So besides marking the trees, you count them too? Yes, I use this gadget called the tally whacker to keep track of the trees. And every 50th tree, I have to take a measurement to find out how much wood is in the tree. I take the height of the tree and also the diameter. The diameter, or width of a tree, is about one-third the way around it. Using a tape measure designed with that in mind, Doreen can read the diameter of the tree directly. And the diameter of this tree is 14.5 inches. Got it! Now you have to measure the height of the tree. So I'll hold the tape measure down here while you climb the tree. No, no, I have a better way than that to do it. I first take a nail and put it into a tree, which is attached to a tape measure. Then I walk out 50 feet and stop. Here's a side view of what Doreen is doing. She pulled the tape straight out and tight to make a 90 degree or right angle at the tree. Doreen looks at the nail through an instrument called a hypsometer. Then she looks at the top of the tree, right below the top branches. The hypsometer tells her that this angle measures 60 degrees. There is only one triangle that has a 90 degree angle, a 60 degree angle, and a 50 foot side between those two angles. Knowing those figures, Doreen can use a chart to tell her the height of this side. It's about 87 feet. All she has to do now is add the height of the nail above the ground, that's about four feet, making the estimated height of the tree 91 feet. So with the height and the diameter, I can figure out how much wood is in the tree. So I take this figure and I multiply it by 50, and that'll give me the amount of wood in the 50 trees that I've counted. But if you're cutting the trees down, why do you need to know how much wood is in them? So when the lumberjacks bid on the timber, they can give us a fair price. Oh, so it's important to the lumber companies so they can figure out how many boards they can get from the trees they buy, right? Right. Thanks a lot, Doreen. And speaking of boards, I'll be talking to Olympic high-diving champion Bruce Springboard tomorrow. Till then, this is your Hollywood reporter, Sybil Sawyer, and remember, Broadway is my beat. Bye-bye. If this much of the show is left to be seen, how much of the show have you already seen? You guys are pretty smart. Hi, 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 hi! Smiling Algorithm here with you once again at Mathematics R Us. Mathematics fans, have I got a super deal for you. This once-in-a-lifetime offer is yours for a limited time only at Mathematics R Us. I call it Smiling Al's do-it-yourself cube. A thousand and one uses for this little beauty, and it's all yours for money. I've taken the liberty of laying out this cube. Of... <sighs> I've taken the liberty of laying out this cube on the Mathematics R Us floor. Wait a minute, you TV pitch man. Wait one minute. A cube has three dimensions. Width length and depth. Now you're probably saying, if I know you, and I can safely say that I do, that that piece of flat junk smiling owls trying to foist off on us is longer than it is wide and very thin. Aha! Wait one minute and watch this and be amazed as I was when I first discovered this phenomenon. Please note, this flat piece of junk has six squares of equal size. One, two, three, four, five, six. Getting the idea? <laughs> no, watch closely, very closely, as I turn the flat piece of junk into a cube by folding these two squares. Oh, I love this. I love this part. Voila! Hey, buddy. Yes, may I help you? Stick him up. This is a stick up. Not now. I'm rather busy at the moment. Did you hear what I said? I said stick him up and give me all of your money. Not now. I'm making a regular hexahedron. A what? A regular hexahedron. It's the same thing as a cube. Oh, I see. Stand back. Give me room to continue. With each smile and owl do-it-yourself cube kit comes an easy follow instruction booklet. Hold this. Notice how I fold these squares and make a wonderful... 
Uh, excuse me, sir. Would you mind helping me for one moment? Wait a minute. I... Please, it's in the name of geometry. Oh, geometry. Okay, well, what do you want me to do? Sit in that square right there. Okay. Like, That's it. Like this? Perfect. Oh, this is easy. Have you ever done this before? No, never. Have you got talent? Really? I've never yeah. done this before. Hey, this is sort of like yoga, you know? Sort of like cubist yoga. <laughs> Maybe we should... Isn't that a wonderful cube or what? Have you ever seen such a fantastic cube in your entire existence? The final touch. Remember, a regular hexahedron has six square faces of equal size. Buy your smiling house, do it yourself cube today, and remember, we here at Mathematics Are Us, we've got your number. Smiling Al, could you let me out now? Smiling Al, hey, come on, a joke's a joke. Hello? Hello, police? This is Smiling Al at Smiling Algorithms Mathematics R Us. Yes, I've got another one. The following sketch is messy, but it is put in the show to demonstrate how many combinations of yucky food you can get with only four toppings. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. So, Sir Person and I ran across this really good restaurant called the International House of Bologna. That's right, Fenzinin. It's bologna served the way you, you like, like it. it. Yeah, sure. Bologna everything. Bologna soup, bologna pie. Bologna ice cream. Yeah, sure. Were we impressed? <laughs> Tell them about the toppings. Toppings? Sure. For, for the, the sandwiches. sandwiches. Yeah, sure. When you buy the bologna sandwich, you get your choice of the toppings. Four great toppings. And you get your choice of any two of the toppings. Two different toppings. Two different toppings, no, no duplicates. duplicates. Zero person, do you remember the toppings, eh? Yeah, Fenzinin, sure. We got four toppings. Chocolate fudge, grape jelly, onions, and, uh, Ketchup, ketchup yogurt, yogurt brain. brain. Yeah, sure, we were stumped. You're stumped. We didn't know which two of the four great toppings to choose from. Either the ever-nutritious and delicious onion and the grape jelly bologna sandwich. Oh, no, mm, that's no. a good one. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Or, 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 we have the irresistible chocolate fudge and ketchup bologna sandwich. Ooh, oh, I like fudge. that one. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. Or something else entirely. Mm, yeah, but we had to think fast. Yeah, sure, there was a long line behind us. Oh, for sure, the International House of Bologna is a popular spot. Yeah, sure, so we made an organized, organized list. list. Yeah, we made a list of all the toppings and the ways they could be combined with the other toppings. Yeah, sure, and to our delight and surprise, we found that there were six combinations of toppings. Yeah, yeah, here we got them here. We got fudge onion, fudge grape, fudge ketchup, onion grape, onion ketchup, and the ever-popular grape ketchup. Mm, yeah, sure, but still, they all sounded so delicious. Oh, so what could we do? We, we bought, bought the, the company. company. Now we can enjoy all of the combinations all of the time. Anybody hungry? Where are the triangles here? I told you, I'll pay you back Friday, Saturday the latest. Well, what, you think that stuff grows on trees? <laughs> I was just borrowing some oranges. <laughs> Time again for America's favorite mathematical game show. But who's counting? And here's America's favorite mathematical game show host, Monte Carlo. <laughs> and welcome to But Who's Counting? Before we begin the game, let's see who's here to play the game. With us today are the Fitzgeralds. Skippy Boop Up, hello, Monty. I'm Ella. I'm Barry. Where are you folks from? One, three, seven, Northwest. Zip code one one double six seven. Do Wonderful. Now, let's meet your opponents, who are the Doles. Hi, I'm Dosey Dole. I'm Robert. <laughs> nice to have you with us. Now, let me tell you how we play the game. We'll choose five digits at random, one at a time, on the wheel. And here's our wheel spinner, the lovely Amber Jeanette. Like you get to strike twice in the same place, huh? Yeah. Now, your job is to place each of the digits in one of the five place value positions on your scoreboard. And the object is to create the smallest number you can. Remember, 
Once you place a digit on your board, you, you can't can lose it. it. The couple with the smallest number Thank wins you, the you. prize. And don't forget the bonus prize for the smallest number possible. You folks at home, get pencil and paper, too, so you can play along with us. Here we go with the first number. Yeah. Oh, number two. The first digit is a number two. Amber, give that wheel a rotation. Another number two. The second digit is... Number two! Oh, nice oh, work, Amber! The third digit. Oh, round and round she goes. Where she's not, only her hair is oh. And the final digit of the first game is. Digit five. Okay, Fitzgerald, what'd you come up with? Well, Monty Baby, we came up with 22,576. Oh, yeah. 22,576. And, Dolls, what do you have? We've got 56,272. 56,272. Well, since we're going for the smaller number, it looks like the Fitzgeralds win the first game. Yeah. That is, the smallest possible number would have been 22,567. Oh, That's 22,567. Didn't make it, but pretty good oh, over here. Now, let's go to the second game. Ooh, ooh. Now, tell me, Fitzgerald, you did so well. Do you have any strategy? Oh, just stay cool. Stay cool. How about you, Dole? Well, if the cow Thank gave us about a... Milk. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to the second game. Nice work, Amber. Another seven. Second digit is seven. Oh, Amber? Yeah. Yeah. Five. Five. And the final digit of the final game is... Two. Okay, Fitzgeralds, what do you have over there? Well, Monty, Monty, baby, we are very happy. We came up with 25,477. Oh, yeah. 25,477. <laughs> what do you have? Well, Monty, we've got 25,477, <gasps> too. Ooh, baby. Well, baby. it's a tie in the second game. However, since you won the first game, it looks like you won the show today. Yeah. Number, that is, the lowest possible number would have been 24,577. That's 24,577. Yeah. Looks like you won the first prize, which is oh, a load of bricks. The second prize is two bricks shy of a load. Well, that's all we have time for. Congratulations to the winner, and that's it for... Square One TV, all the math, all the time, except in Nebraska. The story you are about to see is a fib, but it's short. The names have been made up, but the problems are real. Wednesday, 2.43 p.m. It was hot in L.A. and hadn't snowed for months. We were working on the case of the missing baseball. We figured the ball was in Mrs. McGregor's house, but it had been stolen. The house, that is. We decided to look at the last scene from yesterday's show to refresh our memories. Mathnet Monday. Oh, hello, Howie. No, no luck on the missing ball yet. <laughs> we'll keep in touch. I understand. Howie? Yeah. His dad's due back in three days. If we don't find that missing baseball, yeah. his father's going to turn him inside out. Stymied, Kate. The house with the ball in it is gone. It's just gone. 
couldn't have just flown away. Or could it? George and I returned to Mrs. McGregor's tent to see if we'd missed anything. I don't think we missed anything, Kate. George, look at the trees. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a... They're naked. Right, no leaves. Must have been a heck of a wind. Uh-huh. But look at those trees over there and over there. They're still dressed. How could the wind have blown the leaves off these trees and not off those trees? Maybe it wasn't a natural wind. You mean an unnatural wind? Yes. What if it was a helicopter? And the downdraft from the rotors blew the leaves off these trees? Uh -huh. Sure, why not? But is a helicopter capable of lifting a house? Let's ask a man who owns one. Do you know much about helicopters, General Scarlett? If I don't know it, it ain't worth knowing. Do you know who invented the helicopter, General Scarlett? Yes, I do. Ask me another question. We asked General Scarlett if it were possible for a helicopter to move a small house. He said yes and showed us a videotape of one of the few choppers that could do it. A specially designed model known as the XY313. We asked him if there were any in the area. Well, we have two right here on the base, and there are two others owned by airplane leasing companies. One's in Los Angeles, the other's in Oxnard. Now we were on the trail. We figured the house must have been airlifted, and the only two companies who could have done it were in our area. We were home free. You sure? Well, thanks anyway. So they went the chopper two night before last, George? They didn't. Their XY313 is down for repairs. Hasn't flown for two weeks. Impossible. And the other company didn't rent theirs out either? Nope. Not much call for a chopper like that, I guess, Kate. One that lifts houses, I mean. I felt sure we had him this time. MathNet Monday. Oh, hello, Howie. No, I know. Not yet. Your dad's going to be home in two days. Really? We're working on it. Howie? Yeah. His dad's going to make him walk the plank if we don't get that baseball back. We decided to check with Ginny in the lab to see if those glasses could give us some information. Hi, mathematicians. I'm running a check on the glasses. Find anything yet? 38 things. 38? You know, between 37 and 39. Uh-huh. Those frames have been manufactured for only about a year. So far, 38 have been sold in our area. What are you doing, Jenny? What are those numbers? I called into the local optometrist database to check on the glasses that you brought in. The frames have a serial number, and I sent out the glasses to get the prescription. There are the numbers. I don't know what those numbers mean. Let's ask an expert. George, call an optometrist and find out what visual problem someone has who needs that prescription. Jenny, will you find out how many of the 38 frames have that prescription? Sure can, Kate. I just have to search the database. Three, Kate. Great. And there are the names and addresses. Kate, the doctor says it's a pretty common prescription. They're reading glasses for someone with the slightest stigmatism. Then someone could fly a helicopter without them? Sure. Or play baseball, or ride a pony, or fall off a log, uh -huh. or... Anything but read. That's right. Or any other close work. You know, like needlepoint, or building a model train, or picking aphids off baby roses, or... The names of the owners of the glasses are Justin Michaels, Clarence Sampson, and Alfred Fox. That's what two X's, Kate. That doesn't help me much. How's that? I don't know any of these guys. Don't worry, George. Huh? You will. Thanks, Jenny. Anytime. We still on for Saturday, George? Sure are. Martha's looking forward to it. Going to have meatloaf again? Sure. I can't come, George. I'll be right back. Watch the phone, George. Answer the phone, George. Mapnet. Who? Scarlet. No, this isn't Kate. It's frankly Scarlet, and I don't give... Oh, General Scarlet. I see. Thank you, sir. Got something? Maybe. Said he forgot about one XY313. Right in our backyard. A fellow has one at Burbank. Says he rents it out sometimes. Here's the number. Yes, sir. Kate Monday, MathNet. I understand you have an XY313 for rent. Uh-huh. Didn't happen to rent it a couple of nights ago, did you? Uh-huh. Could you tell me who you rented it to? I'm sorry. Could you tell me to whom you rented it? Yes, I'll hold. Uh-huh. Clarence Sampson. Do you have an address on him? Uh-huh. 727 Bluff Drive. Thank you. That's the name of one of the owners of the glasses, Kate. <laughs> what a coincidence. Two guys with the same name and address. It's one guy, George. We've got our man. Let's roll to 727 Bluff Drive.
Notice something strange, George? Yeah. All the numbers on this side of the street are even, and 727's an odd number. No problem. It just means the place we're looking for is on the other side of the street. Have you looked on the other side of the street, George? There are no odd-numbered houses on Bluff Drive. The address is a phony. Madman, your mission is to eat only multiples of six. Wait a second, wait a second. These are just dummies. And anybody who wants to buy a wooden candy bar has to be a dummy also. <laughs> I don't get that baseball back. They'll tar and feather me. Uh-huh. They'll put me in the stocks. We're trying. Probably run me out of town on a rail. Goodbye, Goodbye Howie. 100% of Square One TV is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. This program was made possible by grants from the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Department of Education, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Corporate funding is provided by IBM. At IBM, we believe education is the key to the future. We are pleased to help support Square One TV as an innovative way to introduce young people to the exciting world of mathematics.